This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics and technology that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest, Mr. Vijaya Raghavan. Mr. Raghavan, Vijaya Raghavan is an expert in IT technology and is hailed as the architect of Kerala's IT revolution. Thank you for coming to our show. Welcome to our show. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, uh, who you are, and uh, what got you into this IT technology, and uh, why you have become the chief architect of Kerala IT revolution? Well, uh, I, I don't think I should call myself the chief architect of Kerala's IT revolution, but I do have <laughs> a small part to play in the period. Um, I used to work with, my start of my career with uh, uh, HCL's instruments division in Chennai. Then I worked uh, in the Middle East for a few years, came back and was part of uh, uh, a major initiative which was uh, at the national level where the National Informatics Center was uh, uh, getting computers. And then I joined the Center for Development of Advanced Computing and was the first center coordinator for its Bangalore Center. As you would know, uh, Center for Development of Advanced Computing was CDAC which uh, actually was India's, or is India's supercomputer development project, which was set up um, uh, in the late um, 80s. Uh, actually, it was in 89, uh, 80, 87, 88 that it was set up. I was one of the first employees in that group and was part of the uh, Bangalore Center and, and set it up. Uh, but then in 89, I got an opportunity and the Kerala government invited me to, uh, to set up the technology park in Trivandrum which instantly okay. is India's first technology park. And that is how I got involved in this uh, sector. And I work with the various companies in that sector. I was CEO only till 97. I was then uh, a member of the state planning board for two stints. Um, but uh, I also have another side to myself, which is I, I set up the National Institute of Speech and Hearing in Trivandrum. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, and the Center for Autism and Other Disabilities has been set up two years ago. Uh, I will talk about it in a minute. Uh, so the IT Technology yeah. Park uh, was established in 1990s, I understand. Uh, and who yes. owns and who manages the park, as I understand, is the largest employer in the state of Kerala. And what have been the success story of this IT park? Uh, can you shed some bright light on this? Oh, good. Uh, you should remember that in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Kerala was not really considered to be a, a major destination for investment. And you should also remember that 89-90 was before India opened up, which happened in 91-92. So basically, we were ahead of the time, but the objective was very clear. We wanted to look at the technology park as a major instrument for economic development. The objective set was 5,000 direct jobs and 20,000 indirect jobs, which wow. I think we met in the first couple of years itself. Uh, you asked about the ownership. It is fully owned by the government of Kerala through a not-for-profit entity, which is called Electronic Technology Parks Kerala. It's a not-for-profit okay. entity, which is supported by government grant. But today, I would say it is quite self-sustaining because it... it it, a lot of the expansion happens with the funds are generated by the rentals and where it has uh, given off uh, real estate to the uh, to the others. But uh, you should also remember that in the 90s, early 90s, uh, getting a telephone connection anywhere in India to take you a few a few years. Uh, those who, who know of those times know to make a call from uh, Trivandrum or Madras to Delhi could probably take you a day because you had to make, uh, <laughs> an urgent call, but you did a lightning call, you would get it immediately. But at that time in 91, when the first, when the first companies came into Technopark, every company who came in was given a telephone line on the day they came into the park, which was the only place in the country where this was possible. Thank you very much. The uh, other thing which happened, yeah, the other thing on the technology well, park which happened in a, in a couple of years from then was that, uh, we had uh, one of the few earth stations that India had for the satellite earth stations. And um, if you, those of you who are l listening to this interview, uh, if you are born 
after 95 or 2000, uh, or you are of an age when you realize things after that, you will laugh at the speed that we had. It was one of the fastest in the country, and it was 64 kbps. Wow. That was the speed, <laughs> okay, which is a fraction of, of what we have today. Well, uh, I remember myself uh, when I was a student in Colorado many years ago, uh, the, you used to have a car punch to do your computer stuff, and now you can get all those technology in your iPhone. So how much technology has advanced is unbelievable. I wanted to uh, have you some talk a little bit about the startup hub, uh, you know, and what do you think of India's initiative? Uh, is the government headed in the right direction? Are they doing the right thing? Are they just uh, kind of uh, uh, drown into the uh, bureaucratic way of doing business, which has been hallmark of India for a long time, and it still continues to be that way? So let me tell you, in fact, there again, to some extent, the Kerala government can take some credit because the first startup policy was uh, done by the Kerala government uh, when I was part of the state planning board. I don't want to take full credit for it. There was a big team of people who worked on it, including a lot of young entrepreneurs. It was that startup policy which the government of India replicated a few years from then. Okay, so oh, okay. Clearly, I think the intent of both the state government and central government in terms of startups is very good. However, you should remember that the overall ecosystem sometimes may not be very friendly to startups. And here I would like to compare something with China. So let us say there is somebody who is doing a hardware design and wants to look at a prototype. In India, it could take a few weeks for the prototype to be done. Sometimes it could take months if you don't have the right contacts. But in China, you could have, and I've seen uh, university students and startups in Shanghai or Beijing work with uh, companies in Shenzhen to actually you get the prototype the next day. Wow. So indirectly, we have a big gap in the ecosystem which we have, which is probably one of the reasons why the make in India has not right. taken off at the rate it should have. So I wanted to uh, shed, uh, have you shed some bright light on the future of uh, IT job market in India and what kind of a continuous training is needed to stay relevant. And uh, I mean, India is one of the largest IT, uh, uh, has I, largest IT companies in the world. As a matter of fact, it was uh, supported by the United States. Uh, you know, there's a, uh, so there has been, so they have a, they have been pillar of that. So tell us a little bit about that. What is skills and ability? What kind of a training they need? Over the last um, uh, few decades, when you see the growth of the IT sector, you see that the growth has slowed down compared to the, <coughs> to the earlier period. It has slowed down slightly because you don't see the same growth levels as you would have seen earlier. Similarly, you would see that the intake by companies of fresh graduates has also come in, come down. So companies which used to take 20,000 or 30,000 people a year have probably cut it by half. At the same time, there is a big, I, I don't want to use the word crisis, but there is what you would call a middle management uh, issue that is happening because in the earlier model, which was about eight to 10 years ago, you had what one would call people managers. And the people manager was somebody who grew from being a software developer. Because of his experience, he became a project lead and then he became a project manager. But what happened was that that kind of a job doesn't exist anymore. When I talk to saw young software professionals or middle-aged software professionals, what I tell them is earlier somebody, when you walked into a room, people respected you for your age and for your position within the company. Today, right. they respect you for what you can contribute to the job that this young guy is doing. So if they think that you are technically competent, they think that you can help that individual in the work that he is doing, he or she is doing, then you have a lot of respect. You could be project manager or general manager, but if you don't understand the technology in which your company is working, you would find that you will actually lose out very, very soon. Which very is well why said. in the last few years, in the last few years, you see a lot of people 
in the age group 35 to 55 who are actually having to move out of the industry and look at other options. So what let's is talk training? about when talk about the training needs. When you talk about the right. training needs, the training actually it is no longer training. I would say anybody who's joining the industry needs to continuously learn. And That's they that. have to continuously exactly. learn the, the technologies which their companies require. So what Very well said. the days when you could get out of engineering college and get trained in something and then take on a job are not gone. Because every company uses something different. That company needs a different kind of a support infrastructure. And you will find that it is necessary for people to be able to learn. But what is happening, and this is something which I see as a very positive development over the last three to four years, is that all the companies, that we talk, good companies, actually create a lot of content and they curate training programs for their employees, depending on the technologies which they think the company requires, which the employees can actually learn through self-learning or through courses which are available on the net. Very well said. So the, it, so the learning is a continuous journey. I want to kind of divert uh, your attention. And you mentioned something about you are the founder of the National Institute of Speech and Hearing. Why did you found this and what do you think needs to be done in the field of disabilities? As I understand your two daughter is deaf. Am I correct to assume that? Yes. Correct. And, Both and my daughters are deaf. That's a, and deaf. this is what energized you. This is what inspired you to get yes. engaged and provide sure. the economic mobility and equal opportunity to the people who are disabled. So shed some light on that, uh, uh, Mr. Vijay Raghavan. My, yeah, my daughters are twins. They they both studied in the uh, they both studied uh, in Trivandrum at a school for the deaf initially, uh, and uh, as they you know I had the opportunity to move out of Trivandrum to go to some other city and uh, try to get them uh, uh, educated there or migrate, but at that point of time a lot of friends said you have an opportunity, why don't look at doing something here? It will benefit a lot of others. So that is how I got involved in a purely honorary basis to set up institutions for the deaf and the national institute of speech and hearing was set up in 1997 the year i left technopark and i continued as honorary director of the national institute of speech and hearing for 20 years until i quit that position in 2017 but by then it had moved from being a very small institution with a few children to one of india's best institutions in this area and in the 2016 budget speech of arun the late arun jaitley he talked about elevating uh, NISH as a National Institute of Excellence, which I thought was a big recognition for all of us who were involved with this. My daughters, in a way, were a motivation to take it to this level because uh, during, the, um, during the initial years, when, whenever I used to travel, I used to look for institutions for the deaf in any of the places I went to. And I visited the Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. Oh, yes. I it's said, it's not that far from here. here. Yes. Oh, we know that. And I said, why don't yeah. we look at something like something like this here? And my daughter studied at Gallaudet for two years before they came back to the, India. Oh, so they did oh, their Bachelor wonderful. of Fine Arts at the National Institute of Speech and Hearing. It was a course which is the first program on a Bachelor of Computer Science and Bachelor of Fine Arts for the deaf, which was instituted in the country. And they got and, and they were part of that. And then they went and studied at Gallaudet University for two years. Uh, it was around this time during the last stint at the state planning board that we said, let us look at disabilities and see what needs to be done. And there was uh, there were two or three major initiatives that we launched. One of them was to do a disability census. So Kerala became the first state in India to do a full-fledged disability census. The second one was, we said we will do cochlear implants free of cost for children below the age of three. And the government did it free of cost. And today, Kerala does not have a wait list for any young deaf child Wonderful. who have a cochlear implant program. At that time, one of the other things was as part of the census, and we did some studies, we found that autism was an area. Yeah, I want to right talk about it. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, was I want you to tell me a little bit about autism and, and about the rehabilitation center and what kind of equal opportunities yeah. you, you are providing the people 
who could be a productive citizen of that nation. Yeah, so the uh, we have what we've set up called CADRE, C-A-D-R-R-E, which is the Center for Autism and Disabilities Rehabilitation, Research and Education. It is a very young organization, just three years old. But at this place, we've tried to bring in the best practices from around the world. I have had some of my, uh, and this is something unlike NISH, has been set up completely by private um, uh, corporate social responsibility support uh, uh, by a few companies with whom we have a relationship. And uh, today we have, we are into our third year, but we've been able to institute some of the best practices that are followed. We are also trying out certain things which are not tried in, tried out in the West. Like, for example, Ayurveda for autism is a major initiative which we are looking at. Right. So, yeah, go ahead. Uh, first of all, it's a noble cause which you're doing, and you did that to inspire your daughter and others and make them a yeah. productive citizen of India and for that matter for the world. So, what, yeah. What has been what has been a success stories of the institution <clears throat> that had that have made a difference and had a, a strong impact and influence in people's lives? Good. So let me st start with Nish, which has a longer history of over 22 years. Uh, we right. have had several of those who have completed the programs from Nish, getting jobs in companies, good companies like Wipro. USD Global and others have recruited people from here uh, as software professionals. We've had several companies in the technology park in Trivandrum who've recruited people from here. The other thing which we've done nice. is we've also tried to look at, I don't want to use the word advocacy, but we have actually looked at doing work in the area of supporting individuals uh, who are uh, with disabilities. And we actually got the government to agree on the reservation for people in the engineering colleges. And uh, just for your information, this year, I have one of our early students at Nish who got admission to the Trivandrum Engineering College, which is one of the best, best engineering colleges in, in Kerala. And she studies at uh, Carnegie Mellon for her master's. Oh, program. Carnegie Mellon, that's, so not, that the, oh, that's a nice school. Yeah. That is the kind of change we've been able to do. In our first batch of children from Nish, who, were, uh, who joined our preschool program. We had a child who went through her education in a regular school with the support of the teachers in Nish, and she became an architect. Again, passed out from the Trivandrum Engineering College. So we have many such cases. I'm talking to you anecdotally. I'm not saying that everybody has got this opportunity, but these were opportunities which would not have come their way if it were not for an organization like uh, Nish. When you come to Very Kedha, well said. Go ahead. When you come to cater in the autism side, I think what we are trying to do here is we are trying to expose professionals in India, <coughs> sorry, in India for the international market uh, to see what it is, see what is happening. And uh, we are trying to get best practices from around the world, which we use uh, in the kind of work that we are doing today. So very clearly we have the, uh, we've tried to get best practices. So we don't follow any specific methodology we are creating our own model where we try to take the best from around the world and and like i say we will shamelessly copy as long as it does not infringe somebody else's intellectual property very well said uh, I, uh, I have a, a before we close our conversation thank you for all you're doing and engaging what's the population of the disabled people in india and do they face hostility and prejudice and discrimination because who they are? And, and what can be done to make sure they are productive citizens and they can make a difference into the society by, because they have so much to give? Good. So I should tell you that in the past, a disability was something which nobody wanted to talk about. They did not talk. His parents would never talk about children who had a disability. They would just let the people know only about the children who did not have a disability. But, right. <coughs> sorry. But what you would see over the last um, 10 to 12 years, people have started appreciating this. They now understand that it is not, you know, the sympathy kind of a thing. It's the empathy that is required, that they also have, uh, have capabilities, and we need to see how we can harness those capabilities. 
So the government of India initially had an act for the person with disability, which was updated in 2000, uh, I think 2013 or so, uh, with a lot more of the disabilities included in that. And initially there were only three disabilities which were looked at, which was the orthopedic, the visually impaired and the uh, and those who are uh, deaf but now they look at intellectual disabilities and there's a list of about 20 disabilities that are there and one of the things which i see is that the national government and the state governments there is a lot of focus here but i should tell you that there is still a mindset problem many parents still don't accept that their child has a disability which will remain for the less rest of his or her life but that is something which we need to change through education. But I think the most Very important well thing is to try and see that, that we get into India, the best practices from around the world. There is very little of research which is happening in India. We need to start moving in that line. And the biggest gap that you will find in the next few years is skilled professionals to support individuals with disability. And we need to be doing something about that. Well, thank you very much for all you're doing it. Uh, uh, since I went to Aligarh Muslim University in the month of October, I had an opportunity to visit Blind Center of the AMU. And if you send me an email, I want to connect you with the principal so that you guys can collaborate. Please. And I would appreciate I uh, that. your help, your support, uh, because that is a, they are, they, they are, they can be productive citizens of that nation for the world for that matter. So thank you for coming to our show and, and, and thank, thank you, you for watching. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week.